last three, four weeks. Um, it's called Peter, Paul, and John. And we've been looking at those characters, pretty famous characters from the Bible, from the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. They were the, you know, three of the sort of preeminent early followers of Jesus, known as the apostles. And um, they, they were three of the apostles. There were more than that. Um, but we've not really been doing character studies on those individuals. We've been looking at the fact that um, they um, had followings. They, they developed churches and, and movements and, and traditions. And uh, those traditions resulted in some writings, uh, which many of which appear in the Christian scriptures, in what we call the New Testament. Um, and we've, we've been looking at some of those. So last week we looked at the letter Paul wrote uh, to Philemon. Um, and uh, we, we looked at the issue of um, slavery and freedom and all sorts of uh, really fascinating issues there. Um, so we've been looking at these writings, and, we, and in particular, we're trying to sort of back up a little bit from these writings and try to look at what were some of the struggles that this early church went through. Because, um, you know, it's just, it's just this very fledgling, vulnerable, beginning uh, movement that really wasn't very powerful. I mean, the church obviously became very powerful eventually. I mean, if you think about it, Christianity has been the sort of dominant religion in the world. It's, it's been uh, the dominant force, to, force in Western culture for 2,000 years, or you know, let's say 1,700 years. Um, but it wasn't always like that. It was actually initially very, it was just a, you know, a sect within Judaism. Eventually it was, um, it, it, you know, it was a breakaway sect from, from Judaism, but um, it was a um, very small movement, um, an initially very insignificant movement. Um, and so it was kind of, the, the beginnings were, were full of struggles and difficulties and challenges and, and really exciting things and some things that were quite um, difficult and depressing. So we've been looking at all of those and we're going to do that again today. And our, our, uh, the letter we're going to look at, or the, the writing that we're going to look at is the second letter of John. Okay, so what we're going to do, um, as always, we're going to sort of, um, um, we're going to do four things, right? We're going to back up a little bit from that letter. Put it in context, so we're going to look at that letter in the context of the Christian scriptures in general. Um, we'll also look at you know, how it was written and why it was written. Uh, so just put a little bit of context there, okay, just briefly. Then we'll look at the letter itself, um, having created some of that context, and we'll, we'll read it all through, only 13 verses, a very short letter. Um, and, and then we'll, you know, after reading it, we'll sort of look at some key points from it. And then what we're going to do, we're going to go back to some of the things we've been talking about throughout this series. We're going to, uh, we're going to look at, um, okay, so how does this letter represent some of the universal struggles that the church is going, going through? And we'll, we'll home in on two in particular. And then we'll look at how does that apply to us, okay? Because I think some of these things, particularly the, the issues that come out in this letter, are really applicable um, to Cedar Ridge and I mean, I mean I think to, to Christianity in general, but I think particularly to the kind of church that we are. And because uh, we can, I think, be uh, in some respects a confusing church, right? Because we're, we're the kind of church that says we're devoted to following Jesus. We're, we're, we're unashamedly Christian in that sense. We're really following Jesus, but we're very open and inclusive, right? And those, those two things don't often go together. And those were things that the church was struggling with right from the beginning. And so we're going to kind of look at that and then kind of challenge ourselves about where are we at? You know, how, how do we need to respond to the, some of those same issues? Um, both corporately, you know, as a community, but also individually. Okay, so that's, that's where we're going to go with this. So let's just um, put this letter, the second letter of John, into a little bit of context. We, we have the Christian scriptures, which are, um, you know, essentially the Gospels and Acts, right? So that if you, if you pick up a copy of the New Testament and start reading through, you go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke, or the author of Luke, also wrote the book of Acts. So, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about Jesus, the life of Jesus. The book of Acts is about um, the time immediately after Jesus, so it's these stories about the early church. Those are the first five books of the, of the uh, Christian scriptures. Then we have all of Paul's letters, okay? So here we have Romans and a couple of letters to Corinthians. We have Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. He wrote those letters to that's the, the leader, Paul, that talk, uh, uh, Ruth was talking about last week. He wrote those letters to specific churches about specific issues. So they're very particular. Um, and when we interpret those letters, we have to be careful about that. That you know, he, He's writing at a particular place, a particular time, about particular issues to particular sets of people. So we've got to, we've got to be careful about too, making too many universal applications. Clearly, there's lots that's very universal in Paul. But some of it is very specific, and we need to bear that in mind. Right? He also wrote some letters to individuals. So he wrote what are called the pastoral epistles, letters to Timothy, a couple of those, and to Titus. And then there's also that very specific one uh, to Philemon that we looked at last week. Um, 
you know, as, as Ruth mentioned last week, you know, Paul's letters um, have they're beautiful letters, full of rich theology. Um, Paul had a tradition too. I mean, we most of those letters really do seem to be written by Paul himself, but some of them, the later ones, were probably written by people in the tradition of Paul, sort of claiming Paul Paul's authority. You know, we that that's totally cool. Um, I don't think it's really much point arguing about all that. It's just you know that sort of thing that happened back then. But after Paul's letters in the Christian scriptures, so we get the, what are known as the Catholic epistles, right? And that doesn't mean they're from the Catholic Church or anything like that. The word Catholic means universal. Um, and those are Hebrews and James, and there's a couple of letters from Peter. We looked at one of those a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then a, a letter, um, letters from John, uh, or associated with John, three of those. Two of them very, very short. We'll look at one of those today. And a letter also from Jude. And those letters, um, they're kind of very um, authoritative letters um, in that they're, they're, they're at least claiming the authorship, authorship of some um, uh, you know, high, high-powered, big-hitting followers of Jesus from those days. So you, know, you, have, you have James and Jude, for instance, who were the brothers of Jesus. They were held in high honor because they were Jesus' brothers. Um, and then you have Peter and John, who were the, you know, probably the two preeminent um, followers of Jesus, as we, as we see recorded in the Gospels. You know, they, they're mentioned all the time. So, so these are pretty high-powered letters in that sense. They're also, and the, this is the reason they're called Catholic, they, they have a more universal appeal. They're, they're not um, written necessarily to a specific church. Now, John might be a bit of an exception there, because the letter we're going to look at today is probably written to a specific church, but it's about very general issues. But these letters, the Catholic epistles, are, are very general, they're very universal, and they have a kind of um, authoritative air, or you might even say authoritarian air. Right? If you read these letters, there's, there, there's a lot of telling people what to do, and, and, it, and, and it, they can feel a little bit uncomfortable at times, right? I mean, we may have noticed that when we read Second Peter, and when we looked at that a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so it's that, and that can be a bit of a struggle for us, I think, as we as, as we read these letters. So, um, now the the last book in the Bible, obviously, is Revelation. That's an a, a, a apocalyptic literature, uh, sort of a vision and a dream of um, the future. Um, I, and you know, we have to be careful how we interpret that. We did a series on that actually a few years ago. Um, but that's how, it all wrap, that's how it all ends up. So, um, so John, this second letter of John that we're going to look at um, occurs in it's one of these Catholic epistles. It has this sort of universal appeal. It has a fairly authoritative, if not authoritarian, uh, way about it or, or, or um, taste to it. Um, let's ask the question, who was John? Okay, so um, I, I think we have a slide about this. So, we, you know, who was John? So this can be pretty confusing because there are a lot of Johns, right? Uh, and this doesn't even include John the Baptist. Um, so we have John the Apostle. That's the person who is written about in the Gospels. Okay, so, um, you know, and, and, and actually, um, you know, we, we know a fair bit about that person because they were a follower of Jesus and we can read about them in Matthew, Mark and Luke and also in the Gospel of John. Then you have somebody called John the Evangelist. Um, and, and let me say, you know, some people would say these are all the same people. But John the Evangelist is the person who wrote John's Gospel. Um, that may be the same person as John the Apostle, but we don't know that for sure, right? Because um, John's Gospel is written anonymously. It doesn't say who it is that's writing it. Well, there's some hints about it. Um, there's also this issue of the beloved disciple. Okay, so in John's Gospel there's reference to the disciple that Jesus loved, or the beloved disciple. And actually it says at the end of John, John's Gospel, that it, um, this Gospel is based on what that beloved disciple wrote down. And so that's where some people say, well, that was, that's, that's the, um, John the Apostle referring to himself um, in this sort of cryptic language. Um, now that, and, and that would be evidence to suggest that John the Apostle wrote John's Gospel. Now, the, the, you know, the issue there is, I, I think John probably, even when you read that section at the end of John's Gospel in chapter 21, it says, you know, the beloved disciple wrote these things down. Um, but the, the sense there is that probably somebody else took that writing or took that um, uh, oral tradition, that took whatever information John the Apostle had, the eyewitness account, and then developed that into John's Gospel. Okay, so, you know, that's how these books were written. They were often written in stages uh, through a process. Um, so we can't, we can't be 100% sure about it. That, let's just say that. Um, then we have the, John, the writer of these three letters that we have in the Catholic epistles towards the end of the Christian scripture. 
churches. Um, again, a lot of people would say, well, that's the same person as who wrote the gospel, and, this, and that person was John the Apostle. Um, clearly, there's a lot of connections between these epistles and John's gospels, thematically and style, but there's also quite a few differences. And these letters seem to have been written later that is probably realistic for John the Apostle to have written them. Okay, so it may be that they were, they, well, we'll talk a little bit in a minute about how they were formed, but they, 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 they're, they're associated with John, let's just say that. Um, and again, they're written anonymously, all right? So it doesn't actually say, I, John, am writing to you. It, they're, they're, sometimes there's cryptic metaphorical language used in terms of who's addressed and who it's from. Um, but we don't have anything really definitive there. And then, of course, there's John of Patmos, and that's the author of... Um, the book of Revelation and some people again would say that that's John the Apostle others would say no that's a different John um, so you know we've got a lot of Johns right there's a lot of Johns to, to consider Let, let's think about this um, more practically because we you know we, we could talk about that for hours um, do you want to go there no um, uh, but um, let's think about um, the Johannine literature just think about that as a whole uh, I think we have a slide on that. so we basically this is this is John's gospel the letters to John and the book of Revelation. Okay, so that's what's known as the Johannine literature. And probably these were not written by the same person. Most likely, and I, you know, there's all sorts of different opinions, and I'm, I'm gonna give you what obviously seems, you know, it's, it's my opinion, and I think it's, um, it's fairly uncontroversial, is that these, th this writing was written by the John movement. Okay, so John the Apostle, this real guy who followed Jesus and was with Jesus and who we read about in the Gospels, he starts churches and he starts a tradition, he starts movements, just like Paul did, just like uh, Peter did. Um, and there's a following called the Johannine community. And there's these churches that develop around the teachings of John. And it's, you know, as we mentioned a few weeks ago, it, it's kind of part of Christianity had a different flavor to it. There was a lot of diversity, a lot of difference. And that, that, was, that was pretty cool, and it, it resulted in some beautiful things. It also resulted in disagreement and conflict. But there was this tradition that built up around, around John. That, that um, tradition probably um, at least helped the writing of John's Gospel. Uh, that, so those community of churches, over time, developed John's Gospel, probably writing down what uh, John had taught um, about Jesus, what John had said about Jesus, or what some of those early um, uh, teachings and sayings were. Um, you know, I, I think we mentioned in the first week that these Gospels really only got written when people realized, uh, oh, Jesus isn't coming back immediately. We, you know, we thought Jesus was going to come back, and once that that period of time got prolonged, they started thinking, we better write things down. We need to capture these stories of Jesus. We need to preserve them. Okay, so um, that's probably what the Johannine community, this community of churches following John, probably what they did. And they then, um, uh, they, that community sort of gels around the issues and the, the teachings of John's gospel. What we know about that community, what we, from the letters of John, is that um, they were very closely connected. They were, you know, we don't really know how far spread out they were, and obviously communication and transport and travel is tricky in those days. But they were connected by traveling around and, and leaders sort of visiting one another's churches, and that's what sort of helped them gel. And there was a lot of friendship and hospitality and connection there. Um, but what we know is that there, were also, there was also trouble, right? They had conflict. And there were two kinds of conflict. One was earlier, early on, and this is the context of a lot of John's gospel, there was conflict with their Jewish roots. And, and eventually they were thrown out of the synagogue. So as I mentioned before, you know, Christianity started as a movement within Judaism. Um, but just reading John's gospel, we see that, that they were at odds with the, uh, with the uh, Jewish community and were eventually expelled from the synagogue, expelled from that um, religious group. And so there was, there was conflict there. They then sort of, they're out on their own, and then they have more conflict, because now they're interacting with the prevailing Greek culture around them, the sort of Hellenistic culture, the prevailing culture of the Mediterranean world back then. And they start running into problems for, of people being influenced by that, and how does the gospel, how does this teaching of Jesus interact with this, this new culture, this Greek culture? And it led to some disagreements, and, and, and there was sort of a breakaway movement within the Johannine community, they were known as the, or they've become known as the secessionists. They were kind of breaking away, we'll talk about them in a second because it's relevant to this letter that we're gonna look at. 
So there's some conflict there, conflict historically with the, with the uh, Jewish religion, and then conflict within the Johannine community where people are teaching things that don't seem to be traditional, don't seem to be really directly associated with Jesus, and it's creating some trouble. And these letters that we have from John are addressing that conflict. So the first letter of John, uh, which probably is not a letter at all, it doesn't say dear so-and-so, it doesn't start off, it doesn't read like a letter, it's more of a treatise about what the issues are, what the conflict issues are, and what the truth is, right? So I said they're pretty authorita authoritative, if not authoritarian. Uh, that John 2, which we'll look at, and John 3 are very short letters that are almost like cover letters with this treatise. You can imagine that they were sent to churches to say, hey, watch out because there's, there's uh, people trying to lead us astray. There are people from within our movement who are kind of leading us off in a different direction, and we need to, we need to take care of that. Um, you know, obviously, they couldn't send out emails or post it on Facebook. They had to write things, and it, you know, it was a very belabored process to get that word out. Okay, so that's a little bit of the context in which we have this letter, which has become known as the second letter of John. So let's turn to that letter. Caroline's going to come up and read it for us. Where's, where's Caroline? So it's a very short letter. Um, it's about the size of one page of papyrus. That's pro perhaps why it's so short. Um, so let's listen to it as though it was being read to us for the first time. It's read to a, one of those Johannine community churches uh, that it's addressed to. Um, and then we'll just look at, we'll dig into it a little bit deeper um, once, we've, once we've read it all through. The Elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also all who know the truth because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. And whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write you. But I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who is chosen by God, send their greetings. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, okay, just a quick question. What, um, what strikes you about that letter? Are there any um, tensions or contradictions in that letter that strike you? Or did that all sound just... Fantastic. Anybody want to offer anything? Yes. Right. There's a, there's a really, I think, fairly obvious big contradiction there, big tension, right? Which is, yeah, walk in love, but don't accept those people in church. Don't let those people who, who, who disagree with you and who are, who are on the wrong side of truth into your home. So there's, there's tension in this letter. And I want to explore that tension a little bit because it, I think it gets to some of these issues that the early church was struggling with and which we can, um, we can apply to ourselves. I think that sort of tension is heightened and exacerbated by the ending, which is, uh, hey, I'm really looking forward to coming and visiting you, you know, which is sort of like, oh, yeah, we had that little bit with Philemon last week, right, where Paul says, you know, uh, I'd love to come and see you, um, which has a sort of almost ominous kind of feel to it. Um, but um, let's just look at, dig a little deeper into some of these verses. Okay, it's, it's only 13 verses, but we're not, we're not even going to look at all of those. But um, it's from the elder to the, chosen, um, to the lady chosen by God and her children. Um, you know, so 
the elder, we don't know who the elder is, it seems to be a kind of a prominent figure in the Johannine community. Maybe the, the leader of the main church, um, but certainly somebody with authority within that movement. And it's to uh, the lady chosen by God. So, I mean, this seems to be, uh, it, it could be written to a, a, maybe there's a female leader of a particular community. Uh, in that day, unlikely, I think. Um, but uh, more likely it's a sort of a mer- metaphorical term um, for the church. And, it, and in that sense, you know, it's, it, 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 it may be to a very specific church or it might be um, you know, using that metaphorical term to, cre- to give a sense of more universal application to, to the various churches in this, in this tradition. Okay, let's look at the next one. So that's sort of the, you know, the introduction on who it's, who it's to, who it's from. Um, you notice it doesn't say it's from John, right? You know, I mean, many of Paul's letters be- begin, I, Paul, am writing this. You know, it, that's not the case with John's letters. Um, Okay, so it goes on to say, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. Okay, so we get the first hint here. Um, I mean, it's sort of joy, but some of your children are walking in the truth. So there's this first hint at conflict and the issue of truth and untruth, perhaps. Um, Just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we have heard from the beginning. Um... I think we've got a bit more to that, is there? I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So there's this command to love, um, very consistent with the first letter of John and very consistent with John's gospel, right? That's a big theme, that God is love and we need to walk in love, and, and, and loving God means loving others, loving one another. Um, but there's this also this call back to the beginning. The, the, the beginning is mentioned twice, right? So there's this um, question about what's true and then a call to the beginning, call to say, which, which we're going to see is really saying, stay true to what we learned in the beginning from Jesus. Learn what, it's, it's like stay true to what we learned from the apostles. It, 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 if you like, we could frame this as conservatism, in the face of progressiveness, okay? And those are kind of, I think, hot topics for churches these days, right? So um, this, is a, this is really, in many respects, a call to conservatism, right? To remain true to the past. Now, so that, that, that's what we see from that section. Let's just look at a few more verses if we go on a little further. I say this, so this whole issue, this challenge, this caution, I say this because um, many deceivers who do not en- acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, the, the antichrist there, that's probably not the best translation. It, it, the, a better translation would be there, would be antichrist, just antichrist. So in other words, this is kind of John's dualism. The, the Johannine literature is full of dualism. There's good and bad. There's um, light and dark. There's, there's um, in, in this situation, Christ and antichrist. There's, it, it, it's full of opposites. It's full of dualism. And so, um, you, you know, we're seeing here that that kind of um, black and white um, talk, talk, there's deceivers and there's truth, there's, um, there's people in community, in this community, and there's people out in the world. Okay, so there he's talking about um, uh, the people who disagree with the original teaching or seem to be challenging it. Um, he's, the writer of John saying they're going out into the world and that's another theme in, in John. It's like you're either in community and you're right or you're out there in the world which is this dark a dangerous place. Um, but we're seeing here the first of what these um, secessionists or this other teaching might be all about. And it's, it's to do with um, people who do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. And the term for this theologically is docetism. Docetism. I think we have it up here. Sorry, docetism. There we go. There we go. Um, docetism. It's a Heresy is being viewed as heresy, and, and it's based on the fact, it's based on Gnostic teaching, okay? And, and, and the Gnostics, um, which, you know, really Gnosticism hasn't fully evolved yet but at the time of this writing, but it's kind of influencing some of the early church. It's, it's um, a, you know, we're not really enough time to get into what Gnosticism is, but, um, but, it, but essentially Gnosticism taught that um, the physical world is bad and the spiritual world is good. So bodies and things like that are not good. They're, they're unclean, they're, they're just... They're bad. But there's this spiritual world which is really good. And, and the goal is, you know, we've got like these 
spirits trapped in bodies. The goal is freedom and release from our bodies to experience the, the spiritual life. And so some of the teaching that seems to have come out of that was that Jesus can't have had a, you know, if Jesus was God, then Jesus can't have had a human body. Jesus was not, in other words, in other words the person Jesus was not real. He just appeared to be real. Really, Jesus was spirit, not flesh. Jesus was not a real human being. And you can see how that would be really problematic, right? That was, that was problematic because uh, inherent in the Christian teaching is incarnation, God in the flesh, God becoming human, and God redeeming humanity. And, and, and the Christian traditional view is not that, that physicality and bodies and things like that are bad, but actually that, that we, we experience this wonderful partnership, this unity with the, with the spiritual realm. Um, and that's that's a beautiful thing. So this teaching was obviously problematic, and there, um, some people seem to have sort of gone off in that direction. Now whether, they, now, whether these are people from within the community who have kind of been encountering some of this Gnostic thought outside in the, in the Greek culture, or whether it's like uh, uh, people being converted from that Greek culture who then start influencing the Christian teaching, we don't really know. But either way, there's this migration that took place, and the writer of John is challenging that head on. Okay, let's look at a couple more verses. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Okay, so again, we get this issue of sort of progressiveness or progression versus conservatism. He's talking about running ahead beyond the teaching of Christ and that being, that being problematic. All right, so, um, and he's calling them back again, as we, we saw earlier, to the beginning, to the original teaching. So there's, this, the, so there's this tension. Now, you can kind of sympathize with those who are running ahead, right? Because if we look at, again, let's look at John's gospel for a moment. If you look in John 14, we're not going to look at this today, but John 14, Jesus says to his disciples, he said, look, um, I'm not going to be with you f for much longer, I'm but my spirit, I'm going to be with you because my spirit's going to be with you. And my spirit will remind you of all truth. It will remind you of all that I've talked about you. So in other words, Jesus seems to be saying that this issue of truth is going to be ongoing. It's not just static now here with me, but there's this, I'll be present with you beyond my, my existence here on earth right now through my spirit and, and that spirit will lead you into all truth. He says that a similar thing again in John 16. In fact, he goes further and says that I can't tell you everything right now. You know, you, you couldn't handle the truth, uh, right, or, or all of it right now. So, but don't worry, because my spirit's going to lead you into into a more fuller experience of it. So, so there's this. There's clearly in the tradition of Jesus an understanding and a and a, and a very valid a need for us to not just sort of have Jesus as this static figure in history, but to engage with Jesus in the present. And, and uh, you know, Ruth got into this a little, little bit last week in Paul's teachings, of Paul's sense that we are in Christ. That, you know, Paul really, you read Paul's writings, he rarely quotes Jesus. He's, he's nowhere near as interested in Jesus' teaching when he writes. I'm not saying he wasn't interested in Jesus' teaching. But he doesn't write much about Jesus' teaching. What he writes about is our encounter with Christ in the here and now. What, is, what does the risen Christ, the presence of Christ in the world, in our lives now mean? And how do we live in Christ? How do we experience that spiritual dynamic? Um, so you can sympathize to some degree with these um, people who are kind of exploring what does it mean to follow Jesus in this present moment, in this culture, in this, in this age, in this, with the challenges we have right now. Um, but things seem to have got out of hand. They seem to have become disconnected from their roots. All right? And so what we, what we seem to have here in this, in this um, letter is, um, you know, we, we, we then get on to, by the way, um, we won't look at it again, but you know, what we mentioned earlier, which is there's don't have that person in your house. Okay, so the, the, the remedy, if you like, the problem is uh, disconnection from the roots. And that's led to this, what is viewed as heresy, believing that Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. And probably a whole bunch of other things too. Um, but the remedy is keep those people out, you know. And, and, and there's this, as I was saying, there's this sense that there's this, in, within this Johannine community, there's leaders moving around, teaching and encouraging and supporting the churches. And they probably, you know, the, any given church may not know who's coming next. And, they, and so there's this warning, like, you know, if people start teaching this way, be careful. And in fact, don't just be careful, but don't let them in your house. Now, it may be that don't let them in your house, and these are house churches, really is, is um, 
would be equivalent to not necessarily saying, don't let the person through these doors, but rather don't let the person have the platform. You know, like, don't let them teach, don't let them have that kind of influence. But it's still, pre I mean, whatever way, and you know, different commentators try to explain this away, it's pretty harsh, it's pretty strict, it's pretty, um, doesn't sound all that loving, doesn't sound very tolerant, doesn't sound very accepting. Okay? This is what the church was wrestling with. This is what the church is struggling with. What should we tolerate? What does tolerance look like? How do we, how do we remain true to the past, but engage with the present and the future and, and live out this faith in, in, in new contexts? That's, that was the nature of the, of the challenge. So we have that going on in this Johannine community. And um, as I was saying, you, know, you, can, you can sort of sympathize with both sides, right? You can see how, yeah, we need to remain true to the past, but, the, but Jesus has also challenged us to engage with the future and engage with Christ in the present. So you know, there's, there's, there's tensions there. It's, it's somewhat ironic also that this Johannine community that is now kind of laying down the law and saying, okay, um, you, you've, got to, uh, you've got to follow um, the tradition, itself was in conflict with, with a Jewish community that said, hang on a second, you've got to follow the tradition. You, you know, you, you, you're breaking away from your roots in a way that's, that's unacceptable and is no longer Jewish, so we're going to have to put you out of the synagogue. So really these are the same kind of issues, right? And, um, and as, we often, as we often see, revolutionary movements often run into the same issues of authority and and, and dogma that um, they fought against in, in, in the beginning. And what we're seeing here, um, and I think what we're seeing in these, um, in, not just in, the, in John's letters, but some of these Catholic epistles, is an attempt to bring some authority to some of these challenges, right? To, there's an attempt to bring um, uh, some unity, some cohesion to some of these challenges. And, 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 and the, we, we mentioned this in, in, uh, when we talked about Second Peter. You know, these letters seem to be from later on, and, and it's, we get in the, the beginnings of more authority being asserted in order to help the church stay um, safe, in order to help the church, church stay stable, in order to help it stay unified. Um, clearly, there's some challenges with that as well. Okay, so there's, there's the authority freedom equation has good and bad on both sides. We're also seeing here the challenge of the conservative progressive equation. Okay, and we can see that there's some good and some bad on both sides. So, so we're going to come back to those and apply, look at each of those, um, th each of those equations um, through the lens of Cedar Ridge. But before going there, I want to, I guess, give a little bit more context to it by looking at the, the struggles that we've noticed as we've gone through this series that the, that the early church experienced. So maybe we can just um, pop that slide up. So we, we've said, you know, we, we haven't really looked at the issue of persecution, but as you read the letters, particularly in the New Testament and the Christian scriptures, a lot of them are about how to cope with persecution, how to deal with it, right? First Peter, for instance, is, is full of that. We haven't really gone there because they're not the letters that we've, we've chosen to look at, but that was a big factor. There's also this tr issue of a transition from a Jewish to a Greek context, right? We talked about that a little bit a couple of weeks ago. We're going to come back to that because that's really today, because that's really, really crucial. There's also this, they struggle with this issue of injustice and inequality. So for instance, again, last week, Ruth talked about the fact that Paul says there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You know, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. There's neither slave nor free. In other words, we are all one in Christ. Except that there are Jews and Gentiles and slaves and free people and males and females um, in, in the real communities that they're talking about. And so this new freedom, this new freedom of oneness seemed, and, and equality and justice, it really upset the apple cart. So we also have Paul kind of, whoa, hang on a minute, you know, things are getting a bit out of order. So in, in, in a couple of places, he, he says, uh, wives, submit to your husband. Children, obey your parents, right? So he's, he's also, there's this tension of uh, freedom, but we need some order because, you know, the, the society might break down, these church communities might break down. And, and, and you know, we, we, obviously we have to be very careful in how we interpret those passages. Um, uh, but we see tension there and difficulty and struggle. Okay, that's, I guess that's a point I want to bring out from, from um, the, the Christian scriptures and, and the Hebrew scriptures too, is as we read them, we're not just reading pure, clear, black and white, simple, here it is, it's all laid out for us. 
we're reading struggle and uh, difficulty and nuance and, and at times confusion and conflict. And it's for us to look at these, uh, these writings and work out how they apply to us. Um, another um, I- issue, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, the apparent delay of Jesus. Okay, they were expecting Jesus to come back within their lifetime. The apostles, the early followers, they started dying off and people, were, it was like, okay, what, how do we respond to this? What, what, what's the, how do we explain it? Some of these writings address that. There's also another big transition. Again, we mentioned this before. The transition from the time, you know, related to this delayed return of Jesus. There's the transition from the apostles to the next generation, right? So the apostles, the early leaders, the eyewitnesses, the people who were with Jesus, the who, and, and the people who were with the people who were with Jesus, they start dying off. And so then the question is, well, where does authority come from? I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we capture what this faith really means when we don't have those people around anymore? Um, it's a big deal. And, it, and, it, and in particular, this final point, how do we address what seem to be like um, uh, tangents or, or heretical teachings, teachings that sort of take us off in the wrong direction, perhaps because of us transitioning from Jewish to Greek culture in terms of what Christianity looks like and some of the influences of Greek culture. I mean, how, how far is too far? And, um, you know, and then how do we, how do we in, in, in an era where we don't have people like Peter and Paul and John around, how do we apply authority to say what's right and wrong and keep things together? So these are the, these are the issues that they were, challenged, they were wrestling with. Now, I just want to pick on two of these that we, we looked at uh, briefly, and we just want to say a few more things about them. That's the second one, the transition from a Jewish to a Greek context, and the transition from the apostles to the next generation. Let me say this about the first one, the transition from a, from a, uh, a Jewish to a Greek context. We see that um, in Paul's writings really clearly. Okay, so Paul fought really hard for the religious context in which Christianity was evolving, which was a Hebrew, a Jewish context. He fought really hard for that not to be, not to suffocate this early Jew- Jewish movement. He, he, he did not want the religious um, rituals and rules to be imposed upon people who were not Jewish, who were from outside, who were, who were Gentile or let's say Greek, you know, people from the Hellenistic world, the prevailing culture of the Mediterranean. He fought really hard. There was a lot of conflict about that. And we can read about that in the book of Acts. We, we read it um, pretty strongly in uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, and he's saying, you're free. You're free. You, God is not about rules and regulations. And um, you're, you're free to live. Um, and you're free to live in Christ. So there's this sort of break away from the religious tradition. Now, then there's this sort of influx and engagement with Hellenistic culture, with the Greek culture, which is, which is full of all kinds of different philosophies, many of which are very permissive, right? So, um, you know, for instance, Gnosticism led to quite permissive um, uh, um, morality. In other words, you know, if the body doesn't really matter, then we can do what we want with the body. So there was a lot of, um, a lot, a lot of sex going on you know, in, in, amongst pagan culture then. Um, also the Epicureans. So that, you know, we have the Cynics, the Stoics, the Epicureans, these Greek, you know, different schools of Greek philosophical thought. They were very permissive. They were like, you know, uh, have, you know is, life is about experiencing having a good time. Um, so they seem to be pretty big into sex as, as well. Um, and so Paul has to come. So, you know, some of these churches start getting influenced by this. Hey, we're free. We can do it. We want. Let's just, just have a good life. And Paul has to intervene. We get an example of that in the first um, uh, letter to the Corinthians. It was probably actually a second letter to the Corinthians because in chapter five, he says, I wrote you another letter. Um, but we call it first Corinthians because we don't have that first one. But he writes there and says, hey, look, you know, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And he really makes the point, look, the reason why I'm saying don't party as hard as you can and have sex with as many people as you can um, is not, well, one, A, it's exhausting. Um, and there's a lot to be said for a good book and an early night. You know, don't you feel like that these days? <laughs> don't you really? I mean... I was into that once, uh, and, but now a good book and an early light seems way more appealing. But, um, but secondly, um, and more importantly, um, it, don't do those things because there's some abstract absolute rule written in the sky where God says don't party a lot and have sex. Um, 
but because it's not good for you. God isn't, God isn't a being who has sort of created this set of rules and then is thinking, how do I get everybody to obey these rules? Okay, you know, it's like God is life, God is love, God wants the best for us. And actually it turns out that partying really hard and having sex with as many people as possible isn't all that much fun. It doesn't lead to a really fulfilled life. It doesn't really lead to um, happiness and, and, and um, joy. It doesn't really lead to, ultimately lead to, lead to satisfaction. Right? So this is what the church is wrestling with. It's struggling with. There's competing agendas. There's, there's competing philosophies for how do you live? What, what's the secret to life? How do you live a fulfilled life? And, and Christianity is way more restrained in the tradition of Jesus because Jesus says, if you want to live life, if you really want to experience life, you need to give it up. You need to, it's, it's about self-sacrifice. It's, about, it's not about just living hedonistically and getting as much out of, it, out of it for yourself. It's about giving your life away and loving other people and loving God and, and, and have it, experiencing this beautiful union with God and union with um, brothers and sisters, our, our fellow human beings, right? So very, very com- different competing ideologies. Um, and so Paul is kind of struggling with one ideology, the, Jew- the Hebrew ideology, and kind of challenging that. And then there's a breakout into the Greek ideology. And then he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he ha- he's having to pull them back. So we see this tension and we see that tension of conservatism versus progression, right? Of progressiveness. There's this need to be rooted. There's this need to be connected to Jesus, connected to the origins, but also this challenge, what does this look like in our context, in our time? How do we, how do we embrace those things? How do we stay rooted, but stay very real, very engaged, very um, applicable? How do we incarnate this faith in our context? How do, we, how do we contextualize it? How do we make it real? How do we continue to follow Jesus and not just sort of establish this set of rules that are now called Christianity rather than Judaism, have it very static and then it's all about following a new set of rules? That's not what it's meant to be at all, right? So we have this tension. Now, the, uh, the other issue there, the transition from the apostles to the next generation, is kind of connected to that. It's really to do with how were those challenges of conservatism and progression, how were those dealt with? Um, because if you think about it, the problem is, the problem that this new generation of leaders had is, well, firstly, their mentors are all dying. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a crisis for any, any leader. So, so the apostles are dying off, and there's not that voice anymore. Secondly, this thing is spreading like wildfire, right? It's growing and spreading. So it's, 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 it, it, the numbers are going up, and it's like, oh, how, how, do we, how do we coordinate this? I mean, how do you... How do you coordinate a church in Ephesus, in modern-day Turkey, and a church in Corinth, in modern-day Greece? I mean, how, you know, how, do we, how do we keep this thing on the road and, and you know, at least having some semblance of unity? Um, and then, as a result of the spread, the third problem is, is the fact that, that it's engaging with new culture, with different culture, and it's causing all kinds of questions and problems and, and people saying, you know, oh, no, uh, Jesus didn't mean that, Jesus meant this. Or actually, you don't worry about Jesus, um, focus on this. You know, so there's all sorts of challenges and, and teachings that are problematic, right? So what happens in order to maintain unity and to maintain some faith is we get a rise in the authoritarian stakes, right? And we see that, as I was saying, in some of these later writings in the New Testament. Now, I don't think there's a single one of us that would question the rise of authoritarianism in Christianity through church history, right? We see that, you know, Constantine, uh, who's the Roman emperor, becomes a Christian, and suddenly Christianity is the state religion in the fourth century. And even up to, you know, up to that point, and certainly after that point, Christianity becomes a major dominant force, becomes very authoritarian, and the church dictates what's right and wrong for about 1,500 years, or about another, what, uh, 1,100 years, up until the time of the Reformation, which is, we're celebrating the 500th year of the Reformation um, this year. So we, we get church and authority, but I, would, I posture that these letters that we're reading have some of that. It's the beginnings of this authoritarianism, and we, we just have to see it for what it is and interpret these letters that way and recognize that it was a struggle. I'm not saying that these writers intended to create some kind of authoritarian monster, but clearly we get, you know, we've just read a letter that's pretty authoritarian, right? It's saying love one another, but don't love those people or don't accept those people into your, into your home. They're trying to preserve some unity. They're trying to preserve 
some correctness. And it's a challenge. And we have in these letters, I think we have a slide for what we might call early uh, Catholicism. It's, 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 a term, it's Catholicism with a, actually with a small c. It's not like Catholicism as in the, the Catholic Church, but Catholicism just means universality. But we have this sort of more attempt at universalizing the faith in the first few centuries. Um, and that's what in, in these letters, like the letter of Peter's letters, John's letters, Hebrews and James and Jude, we have this acknowledgement of a fading hope of Christ's imminent return. In other words, these writers are thinking, man, we're in this for the long haul. What do, what do we do here? There's an increasing institutionalism. So churches, are, you, know, you start hearing about bishops and leaders of churches. I mean, we've got that in the Johannine community, right? In these, this letter we're seeing. It's like the elder writing to another church. Is, you know, it's kind of like a denominational uh, edict of some kind. So, it, so more organized, uh, more authoritarian, and then preservation of faith through doctrine. So what we're getting here is a move away from a definition of faith in the Pauline tradition, Paul's tradition, which is faith in Jesus, okay, in Christ, um, and what Jesus talked about, about trust, trust me. You know, faith in Jesus' terms was all about trust. And that's what belief means for Jesus. But we're now shifting a bit to belief about Jesus, right? So the church is saying, well, we know what's right, what's wrong. Let's establish some doctrines, some creeds, some, um, you know, eventually what's in the canon of the Bible, you know, what books are in, what books are are out. And and all those are are clearly, were clearly necessary, um, but they also bring kind of challenges because it it can create them and us and it 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 can become exclusive and it can shut down, actually, as we see as we go throughout church history, it can shut down freedom, it can shut down um, um, people really engaging themselves with God and then just beginning to follow a church or a leader um, or certain doctrines and dogma. And, and we, we lack that sense of what Paul was talking about, of being in Christ and this dynamic engagement with Christ. We, we lack what Jesus was talking about in John 14 and John 16 about um, engage with the Spirit. I'm with you. I'm with you always. So engage with me because I'm going to, I'm going to teach you and lead you and and I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I think what Jesus means is that you're going to be further enlightened, all right? So we've got here in these letters in, that we've been looking at over the last few weeks, two big challenges. And I'm sorry it's taken so long again to, to, to get to this point, but we've got two big challenges. We have the challenge of authority versus freedom, if you like, and with the challenge of conservatism versus progressiveness. Let's apply those, apply those to Cedar Ridge, right? And, and what might we take away from those, personally, individually, as well as corporately? Well, firstly, we need to be absolutely 100% rooted in Jesus, right? We're followers of Jesus. So we can't throw off our roots. We can't just discard them. In that sense, Cedar Ridge is a very conservative church, right? You won't hear that statement very often, but it's, there you go. Um, we're, in that sense, we're very conservative. Now, do you remember we talked about the Wesleyan quadrilateral uh, a few weeks ago where we talked about how do, you, how do you interpret truth? Well, we have scripture, we have tradition, but we also have reason and experience. Well, one of the, or two of the ways we remain rooted is through scripture. It is through tradition. Those are not bad things, right? So we can't just throw scripture out. We can't throw tradition out. We should wrestle with both of those, critique and, and, and work out what it means, and, and that's why we're, we're doing series like this, because we really take the Bible seriously. Um, we have to stay rooted, right? And we don't just get to make it up. Um, I don't just get to make it up. That would be really inappropriate. I mean, who the heck am I? And who the heck are you? We've got a whole 2,000 year of tradition that we've got to, we, we come in the, in the wake of, and we need to respect that and value that, critique it for sure. But, and we have, we have scriptures that tell us about Jesus and that tell us about the struggles of the early church and have people who are around Jesus telling us about what Jesus really meant. I mean, we've got to take those things really, really seriously. That's how we stay rooted. But at the same time, we have to explore what does it mean to follow Jesus in the here and now? How do we engage with the living Christ now? How do we engage with our culture? What does this spirituality look like in our lives, in our, in our setting? And that means, talking about the wisdom and quadrilateral, we need to engage with reason 
an experience, right? What's our current experience? What, what, let's reason together. Let's, be, let's think about this. They were doing that back then. They just had a diff very different mindset and very different worldview. We likewise need to engage with those faculties. Those are really important. And we, so we, and, and we need a we should be pushing the envelope because Jesus pushed the envelope and the early church pushed the envelope. We, we should be constantly leaning into what does this look like in our setting, not just thinking, okay, we've got this set of dogma, creeds, and all this sort of you know, stuff there. Like, all we need to do is pay tribute to that and, and everything will be fine. No, Jesus is calling us into a dynamic relationship, a dynamic faith, right? So we, we need to embrace, embrace both of those. Um, Secondly, there's the tension then of authority and freedom, right? There, there's a tension there. And I think we struggle with that tension here at Cedar Ridge, right? There's good things about authority and there's bad things about authority. Like, what are some of the bad things about authority? Anybody want to um, mention some? What don't we like about authority? Like, authoritarian, authority in church. What, what are some of the negative things about authority in church? We've mentioned some of them already. Just shout them out. Afraid to express doubt. So there's lack of self-expression. Yeah, fear. Can be abusive. Can be abusive. Yeah. Be manipulative. Yeah. People telling you what to do. It's sort of, you, 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 you could end up being afraid and switching off your brain, or you could end up being lazy and switching off your brain, right? It can suffocate creativity. It su suffocates new thinking. Um, Right, so we, you know, authority can be a really bad thing. But what are some of the good things about authority? <laughs> Leaders get to do what they want. Don't you think that's a great thing? Yeah, just shout them out. Structure, yeah. Consistency, focus, unity, right? I mean, like, the, the church, that's what they were struggling with. They were trying to be focused and united and have momentum and impact. And you, and you can't do that if everybody's just making it up as they go along and, and, and anything goes, right? So now we have some of those struggles here because honestly, we are a culture, and I include myself, we, we, our culture, Cedar Ridge, and I include myself in this, is we don't want to be told what to do, right? You know, that's our culture. That's, that's a, in one sense, that's America, right? It's, it's, you know, freedom is everything, right? Um, but that can lead to us being very individualistic, very, very, it, it, what, what's in it for me? What, you know, what do I think? And there's one positive side, I think, of authority, which is it can bring cohesion and bring community. Now, one bad thing about authority is it can lead to dependence on a leader, right? And we see that in church history, like, you know, you think about what happened in the Catholic Church and all the abuse that that brings. When we look to one leader or one church or one authority as the source of all things. But the positive side about it, in, if it can bring about community, is it makes us more dependent on community than on an individual. We, we, we look to the community and the interests of the community. Uh, we become more dependent on the community. The, 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 there's a beautiful thing about a more free, um, self-expressive environment too, which is we, we can look to ourselves. We take ourselves seriously and we challenge ourselves um, rather than looking to somebody else to do it all for us. Uh, but we also, um, and, and in that context, we can also perhaps look more to God, right? We can, we can uh, you, you know, we're not just looking to the church. I mean, for instance, um, it would be really inappropriate of me, to be honest, to tell you what to do. I mean, what, what's, what's with that? When actually I think what Jesus wants all of us to do is work out our salvation, <laughs> Um, to, to work out what, what we, what, how this impacts me and ha what I need to do about it. So there is an individual aspect to it that's really healthy about the, the, a more free um, uh, culture. But we have this, we, there's a balance, right? There's a, there's a need for a balance. And, and perhaps balance is the wrong term because it's not just, you know, let's get 50-50, let's have a bit of authority and a bit of this. Um, you know, it's not either or, but it's some paradox. It's some way, we, we need to, um, I think that's what we're trying to do as a church. We need to tr find a way to have cohesive authority around things like our vision and our values, but with, um, with freedom where everyone's included. We have diversity. We have 
different, different perspectives represented and, and we, we, we're, we're more of a mosaic that's helped. So that, that community is not just uniformity, right? So that's some of what we're, we're, we're struggling around. Um, some of that is gonna mean sacrifice, right? Because in, or, in order for us to be cohesive and move forward, we have to at least be on the same page about certain things. So for instance, we've been through this strategic planning process, which we've tried to make like our vision process, we've tried to make it inclusive and involve the community, involve a diversity of leaders, but it ultimately it comes down to us together saying, and then the leadership kind of affirming, okay, this is the direction we're going to go in. So, you know, part of the challenge is for us to, um, rather than individually thinking, you know, that's, oh, that's not really my cup of tea, or I'm, not, I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to do that. What if we were all to respond um, around the basis of, of community and follow because we're in this together, right? And that's what leadership, that's what authority in a positive sense accomplishes. For, let, me give you a, let me give you an example of that. Just simply coming to church right now on, on a Sunday is in some, some sense an, uh, an authoritarian act, right? We, somebody said, we're going to have a service, everybody come, and we get a choice about whether we come or not. But really, it's a community thing, right? we all could just not come. And, and, and probably for a lot of us, we, you know, we, we don't come every week. And I, you know, there's a couple of weeks coming up where I won't be here, I'm on vacation. Of course, we're not gonna all be here every week. But coming is not just about us. It's not just about what we're gonna get out of it or not get out of it. We're contributing to the whole. We're making something cohesive. We're creating some energy. We're creating space for other people who we might engage with at that time, you know, when, when we come here together. So there are some things that it's really important that in a way we put aside our individual freedoms or our individuality and we, we, we buy into the corporate, we buy into the community. That's almost impossible without some form of authority. Okay, so we, we're always going to wrestle with that challenge, but I think it's a really important challenge for us. Okay, so we need to be a church that in one sense is authoritatively organized but we need to be committed to freedom of expression and, and, and diversity. We need to be a church that is absolutely rooted in the past, in that sense, very conservative, but we, we have to be a church that is progressive, that is constantly engaging with the here and now and the challenges of, of, of following Jesus. So we're gonna have communion now, and again, I'm really sorry we've gone on um, long, but we're just gonna take communion. We, we're, we're gonna sing a song, and maybe the musicians um, can come up, and we're just gonna close out with this communion time, and I, I want us just to really kind of pick, um, wrestle together with this challenge. Um, because for some of us, you know, the, the challenge is we're afraid of authority because we may have had some problems with that in the past. And we read a letter like John 2, and it, 2 John, and it's like, whoa, I, I really don't like that. Um, uh, and maybe we, maybe we just needed Jesus to help us get over some of that. Um, maybe for some of us, um, we're, you know, we're, we're um, afraid of being conservative. We're afraid of the past, uh, you know, and some of the some of what the church has done, or even some of you know when we read scripture. Um, and, um, and so, we, in coming to communion, what we're doing really is connecting very specifically with the past. Right? This has been communion has been done for centuries, um, and we, we, we're connecting to a tradition that goes right back to Jesus. So this is, in one sense, very conservative, right? And in one sense, quite authoritarian. It's been a dictate from the church. In another sense, this is very progressive because we're engaging with Christ right now. You're not engaging with Christ through me. You're engaging with Christ directly. As you come and take the bread and wine, we are, we are metaphorically taking Christ in. We are, we are kind of metaphorically experiencing that union with Christ that, that uh, Paul talked about. So this is an opportunity for us uh, that we have, not just now, but week in, week out, day in, day out, to engage with the living Christ. That's, and and, and what, what Christ might challenge us with and how we, what, how we need to change. So that's, that's very progressive. That's very right now. It's also very inclusive because you know everybody can come. You don't have to be from Cedar Ridge. You don't have to be from a certain de denomination. You don't have to have gone through a certain catechism or, 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 or pledged allegiance to certain doctrinal statements or anything like that. Everybody's welcome because everybody is a child of God and everybody's called into union with Christ. And 
I would say the only prerequisite is that you want more of God, right? And if you don't want more of God, then I won't bother, because I mean, it's, why, why bother? But if you want more of God, if you want more truth, more reality, more love, more life, everybody's invited. Come and take the bread and the wine. Okay, so we have, we have that, um, th- that sort of paradox, that tension, even in communion right now. And I, I don't, just ask you, as we sing this song, so take communion and then sit with, okay, what's my struggle around those issues? Am I too much on the progressive side? Or too much on the conservative side? Am I too anti-authoritarian? Or am I too pro-authoritarian? Right, so, where, and what needs to shift? What needs to change? What, how do I need a shift even in my sense of belonging to this community? And my place in this community? And my approach to this community? Approach to the people I'm sit with? Approach to the way the community is led? And, um, and the best efforts of all kinds of leaders in this community to, to lead forward. Let's just sit with that for a moment and take the challenge that the early church wrestled with really seriously as we have commun- communion. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your presence here and now. Thank you for the consistency of that presence through time. God of history and reality, we engage with you now in in mystery. And we ask you to come and fill us. Come and transform us. That we would be able to be your love and your life. That we would truly be able to walk in love in this world, in our setting which is so different from the settings we've been reading about. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.